Welcome to Unit 2. In Unit 2, we're going to be looking at learning objectives and learning outcomes. I am still Professor Inegbedion Juliet Ovajaji. By the end of this unit, you will be able to identify the criteria for measuring well-stated learning objectives and outcomes. You'll be able to differentiate learning outcomes from learning objectives. You'll be able to state at least 10 measurable vets that can be used to measure bloom taxonomy of learning objectives. Now, let us look at aim, objective, outcome, and competencies. These are terms that are often used, and sometimes some persons get confused with these terms because sometimes they are used interchangeably. But there are differences. Now, let's look at the aim. Aims are broad general statements of teaching intention. They express what the teacher intends to cover in a program or course or block of learning. It's written from the teacher's point of view. That is, is teacher-centered. Objective. In some contexts, objectives are also referred to as goals. Course or module or program objectives are specific statements of teaching intention. This indicates the specific area or areas the teacher intends to cover in a block of learning. And when you're talking about the use of objectives, there is controversy on the use of objectives. Because at one point, we see it as teacher-centered, at the other point, it's stated as if it is the learner-centered. So because of this controversy, now we have the learning outcomes, which seems to be more directional to the learner. These are clear statements of what the learners can do after they have been exposed to some learning experiences. Learning outcomes are clearer and more direct than objective in directing learner-centered learning. Unlike the objective, the objective is the teacher-centered. And because of the controversy that was there, because at some point some people will state it as teacher-centered, at another point as learner-centered, but there is a consensus among educators to use the learning outcomes for the learner-centered because it helps to bring out, expose the learning experiences that the learner would have and gives a clearer picture. Now, again, coming up with learning outcome, there is another terminology that came up also, and that is competencies. Looking at learning outcomes, Looking at competencies, again, <clears throat> you have controversies. There are controversies again. It is observed from literature that these terms are not so differentiated. So, Adams tried some years back to take a narrow view of what could be done. But however, in looking at competency, it is representing a combination of attributes in terms of knowledge and its application, the skills, responsibilities, attitude, and attempts was made to describe the extent to which a person is cap capable of performing them. So therefore, because of this controversy, are not clearance, because looking at competency, the argument is that competency is not looking at just one thing. It's holistic. You are looking at skills. You are looking at responsibility. You are looking at the extent the person is able to actually bring the skills, responsibility, the attitude, pull them together to form a whole. So because of that, again, competencies today is seldom used. Is now used frequently like the learning outcomes. So the learning outcome has come to stay 
as a way that you can use to evaluate learning. And it is the learner centered. There are three domains of learning. These three domains of learning will have the cognitive or the thinking domain. And the proponent of this domain is Benjamin Bloom. Sometimes people think that Benjamin Bloom developed the three domains. From literature, it is known that yes, he was solely involved in two of the domains which is cognitive and affective. And he did work with David Crowell. But his name appears at the first auto where he worked on the cognitive domain. So it was named after him. And that is why up to date, when you're talking about the cognitive domain, we talk about Bloom taxonomy. And it has come to stay. So the second one is affective domain. Like I said, Bloom equally worked on the affective domain with David Crowell. But again, in this instance, it was David's name that appeared first. So therefore, it is being recognized that David is the person that came up with the affective domain. So just like we now associate the cognitive or the ticket domain to Benjamin Bloom, the affective domain is now associated with crowds. Then the last one is the psychomotor domain. And that was done by Anita Haru. We are going to look at these three domains and see how it affects our online course design and how it affects our selection of open educational resources. Now let's start with the cognitive domain. Looking at the cognitive domain, we have the original domain that is this here of the blue taxonomy, and you have the reversed version. If you look through the triangle we have here, there are some changes. Here we discover where you have on the, uh, knowledge is now remembering, where you have uh, uh, comprehension is now understanding, and going up there. You have sentences, evaluation in the old. Here you have evaluating and creating. So this has been revised. But what is prominent here, it guides the way we set our learning outcomes. If you look at this bottom part, if you set your learning outcome in just remembering, it means it will not be a higher order. But if you set your learning outcome in creating, that gives you a higher order. And the way you set your learning outcome determines the type of learning activities or learning resources you're going to require. And that also will determine the kind of performance that your students will be able to perform after going through that knowledge or after graduation. So we're quickly going to look at the action verbs that are required when you want to develop your learning outcome using the Bloom taxonomy on the cognitive domain. Now we start with a bottom remembering. You can use such uh, active verb like define, list, duplicate, recall, recognize, reproduce. You see, at this level, it does not really require deep thinking. It does not require deep learning before you can do that. Then the second part of the standing, you have to classify. You can tell classify, describe, give example, select, and interpret. On this, you discover that it's, it's coming up a little bit higher than the first. Then when you then come up, you want the student to be able to apply the knowledge. You can use such verb like apply, choose, solve, use, prepare, modify, diagrams, and the depth. Now, when you do this, you are giving opportunity now to the student to be able to apply what he or she has learned. And in doing this, it means when you are preparing your content, you will also be looking at learning activities, learning resources that will give opportunity to the student to be able to do this. 
Now you come to the uh, analyzing aspect, and you can use such verbs like contrast, compare, differentiate, examine, illustrate, and apply. And when you come to the next one, the evaluating, you can use such verbs like appraise, categorize, critique, justify, summarize, compare. You see that you cannot evaluate except you are able to master the other ones below. So when you come into evaluation, it means you would have remembered, you would have understood, you would have been able to apply, you would have been able to analyze before you can evaluate. So it's higher order. And the last one is coming up to create from what you have learned. At this level, you'll be able to write, categorize, plan, produce, invent, and generate. These verbs are not limited. They are more. But these are just few that you can use from time to time. And when you set your learning outcome, defining your learning outcome that with adequate uh, action verbs, it helps you in getting the resources that will help meet that requirement. Look at affective domain. Affective domain have five levels. We have receiving, responding, valuing, organizing, and characterization. Now let's take that one after the other. Looking at receiving, what does it mean? It means the learner sensitivity to, uh, to the existence of stimuli, awareness, willingness to receive. And if you have to test this, you can use verbs like feel. You can use verbs like experience, pursue, attend, and perceive. Then you have responding. That is the second level. And when you're talking about responding, it means that the learner's active attention to stimuli on his or her motivation, willingness to respond, feeling or satisfaction. And verbs you can use to test this could be confirm, allow, cooperate, enjoy, or satisfy. Then you have valuing, that is the next level. And this refers to the learner's belief and attitude of what. And here you can use verbs like justify, uh, respect, search, persuade, or believe. And you have the thought level, organizing. And in terms of organizing, it means the learner's internalization of value and believing involving uh, values and organizing the values system and being able to become internalized with the learner within the learning that he has been exposed to. And to actually measure this, you can use verbs such as examine, clarify, synthesize, create. And the final level is the characterization. This requires that the learner's higher internalization and again the behavior that will generate a new set of value. And in this instance, you see the characterization at the philosophical life come into play. And you can use such verbs as review, conclude. Look at the psychomotive. On the psychomotor tool, we have categories. And here, the first in the category is perception. Use of senses to obtain clues. And you have some verbs you can use, like choose, describe, identify, distinguish. Then you have another category, set. And what does it represent? Readiness to take action. And you have verbs like begin, display, explain, react, and show. The next category is guided response. And here you have knowledge of the steps required to perform a task. And here the verb is assemble, build, calibrate, construct, or display. And you have another step that is mechanism. On that mechanism, you're expecting that the student will be able to perform tasks in a habitual manner. And to test this, you could use assemble, build, construct, dismantle, and fasting. Then you have the complex overt response. And here you are expecting the student to be skillful, produce skillful performance of motor acts. And to test this, you use assemble, build, calibrate, construct, or face met. 
Then you have the, the next category, adaptation. And what you're expecting from the student at this level is that the skillful performance of motor arts and modification of movement a problematic or new situation. Not just the way it has been, but now you'll be able to advance from what he or she has known to a different situation. And you can use verbs like adapt, alert, change, rearrange, reorganize, vary, and revise. Then the last one is origination. With the origination, you are expecting that the student will be able to create new movement or task from what he or she has learned. A new thing coming up. And if you go in with the cognitive, it means you are looking at it at the creative level. And you can now use such verbs as arrange, combine, compose, construct, design, and originate. So these are the three domains that we have when we are going to consider our learning outcomes. And you set your learning outcome to reflect any of these domains. The cognitive, this with thinking. The affective, this with social. It deals with feeling. And the psychomotor, this with doing what you're going to do. So in this case, remember you're going to consider the three. You can have a combination of all, depending on what your goal is and what you want to achieve in your course. Now, let's look at the element of learning outcomes. Learning outcomes are very, very important. One is the element one, it must be specific and well defined. Secondly, it must be realistic, observable, and achievable. Thirdly, it must be measurable. And fourth, you will be able to write in simple language and with active verbs. These are the elements that you need when you are constructing your learning outcome. What are the benefits of learning objectives? One, it gives guide to learning. Secondly, use for content planning. And finally, it guides evaluation. Now, let's look at the benefits of learning outcomes. First, it gives specific direction to learner, to specific knowledge and skill that we acquire in a specific training or lesson. It motivates learners to knowing what they are going to Go, going to learn and go away with. And it makes learning more effective. It puts the teacher or the trainer more in touch with the learner's perspective. It guides the teacher when selecting learning activities and resources. Just like you're going to be selecting your learning activities and resources, selecting your open educational resources specifically, you will need the learning outcomes. It is the learning outcome that will give you a guide on selecting adequate open educational resources. Then it serves a criteria for evaluation to the learner, tutor, and management. So we are looking at it that it helps to provide evaluation, not just on one side. To the learner, it helps to evaluate. To the tutor, it helps to evaluate. And at the institutional level, it helps in evaluation. Now, in conclusion, learning objective is teacher-centered, while learning outcome is learner-centered. The course objective will help the teacher to plan the course content, while the learning outcome will direct the teacher on the selection of the learning activities, resources, pedagogy, assessment, and the learning modes that will help the learner achieve the stipulated learning skills and ability. With this, thank you for listening.